It is election day in the United States of America from Washington, D.C. for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from the nation's capital, we begin with the big issue, the final push for America's vote. We're just hours away from the most important midterm election in American history. Remember, the power's in your hands. We're going to take back the House. We're going to take back the Senate. You wait. Uh, Democrats get blown out on Tuesday. There's people running for office that want to take away our rights. Democracy is on the ballot. It is. They spent trillions of dollars and printed trillions when they were warned, if you do this, you are going to drive inflation through the roof. One of two, the two major political parties in our country openly flirting with political violence, and we have seen the results that that brings. We're possibly one day away from losing this country. Well, there's a lot on the line in this election. It's a country-saving election. We just have to remember who in the hell we are. We are the United States of America. Joining us now to discuss is Bloomberg's Anne-Marie here in D.C. and Henrietta Trays of Vader Partners. AMH, go through the closing arguments for us as we count down to Election Day result time. Well, you had the President of the United States, Joe Biden, campaigning yesterday, Jonathan, in Maryland. His closing argument was really about this is an important election for our lifetime, both in terms of preserving American rights, things like abortion he leaned into, as well as welfare programs like Social Security, like Medicare, which he says the Republicans, if they get a control and control of some of the economy, will want to dismantle. And then for the Republican side, the message hasn't changed, has it? For the last six, seven, eight months, it is, do you feel safer? Are things going up? And that's really what the focus is on, crime and inflation. Henrietta, you've heard the messages there, the closing arguments. Which one is resonating more? You know, no matter your position, the American public definitely agrees with both parties that this is a critical election. Turnout is broken records in Georgia. They broke single day election records. Um, I think it's resonating regardless of which party you subscribe to. They are getting people out to vote. And today looks to be no different. It should be um, pretty record setting election day, which is critical, obviously, for the Republicans who are trailing um, after Democrats tend to vote early uh, in greater numbers. So it's a critical day and everybody's acting like they know it. Henrietta, it's clear that inflation is top of mind. Is it clear from your perspective what the electorate blames that on? Um, I think the electorate and, you know, we even heard Donald Trump yesterday say that it's to do with energy prices. So a big portion of that is out of the control of either party. We've seen Congress try to address energy prices for the last year, and there's really very little they can do. Biden's obviously released the SPR as extensively as he really can, uh, but it's the war in Ukraine. And I think voters are smart enough to understand that. Um, so when President Trump, uh, former President Trump says that that's the leading indicator of inflation, I think we need to be mindful of that. And that's what Democrats and Republicans are taking away. Um, as a previous guest of yours was speaking to, every voter drives down the street and sees the price of gas and knows that, you know, five bucks is pretty high. So I think I've it's asked, a huge problem, but energy is the main driver. I've asked market participants all week what they'd like to know the outcome of right now. Would it be the midterms or CPI? And I've had mixed questions. Let me ask the question of both of you, this one right now. If you could know the out outcome of one race in these midterms, which one would it be? And Anne-Marie, first to you. I'm going to go with Pennsylvania because the polls are really showing that the Republicans are closing in in Nevada, right? And right now the Democrats hold that race. Georgia potentially goes into a runoff, so I'm going to put that to the side for the moment. I want to know what happens in Pennsylvania because this has gotten so much tighter and it was a really difficult debate for Democrat John Fetterman, and he was really starting to gain a lot of momentum. And I wonder if Mehmet Oz is able to really push through in the final. And that is the one where you saw the rock stars of the Democratic Party come out. Barack Obama, Biden, they have all been making stops there to support him. Henrietta, what about you? I am a lot more selfish than Anne-Marie, I have to admit. I do not want to do this for another four weeks. I would like to know Georgia tonight. <laughs> do you think we will know Georgia tonight based on a poll so far? 
No, I don't. Um, and I, you know, that is a real bummer. But there is some really incredible data coming out of Georgia and the great work of the U.S. Elections Project tracking. Um, as you know, Georgia does not track voter preference or party registration. So we only have really race to go by. A great metric, um, but it is helpful in the context that we don't have any other data. And the black voter turnout is exceeding its 2020 thresholds for this stage of the election. It's under its January 2021 threshold of 30.3, I want to say it was, and they're at about 29.2% right now. So that bodes really well for the incumbent, Raphael Warnock, and fingers crossed they call that tonight or tomorrow. <laughs> Anything before the next four weeks, I'll take. I think market participants are hoping for the same thing. Henrietta, the Georgia runoffs of early 2021 were so consequential, the policy from this White House. Is this just as consequential this time around? I, you know, to be honest, it, to get back to your first question, I'd rather know CPI because, quite frankly, uh, regardless of the outcome of the election, neither party is going to have a sizable enough majority to do much of anything. Um, so I think investors love a split Congress. They love gridlock uh, because it means there won't be, you know, tax changes or spending ramifications. Um, I would rather know CPI just in general because at the end of the day, we have two months that I think are going to be really critical here between uh, Election Day and call it Christmas. And then we're going to be in two years of gridlock regardless of the outcome tonight. So um, that's, that's I think, my main takeaway for investors. The bigger picture is 2024 and how, is it, how this election sets us up. Uh, particularly, I think Nevada has a lot to say about that. You have no idea how disappointed Anne Marie is. She was hoping for four <laughs> weeks of an election and you want CPI Thursday. I need something to talk about. You're not alone. AMH, the final word here then. One thing we will be talking about potentially the announcement of an announcement from the former president, Donald Trump. What is that announcement? He keeps teeing it up, and he did it again last night, even putting a date on it. He will have a big announcement, he says, November 15th in Mar-a-Lago, of course, his resident and resort in Florida. And that announcement is likely going to be his third bid for the White House. And that just really sets off the 2024 presidential election just a week after the midterms. And then that's all we're really going to hear for the next two years, who are going to be the presidential candidates for the Republicans and the Democrats. And the former president is making the first, first bid for it. AMH, thank you. As always, Anne-Marie here in D.C. Henrietta, thank you. Henrietta Trey's there of Vader Partners. With us now is TD's Priya Misra and Michael Dada of MCAM Partners. Priya, you get the honours. The first question. CPI, Thursday, I can give you the results right now, or the outcome of these midterms. Which one do you want? CPI. Um, I'd actually like Every CPI time. for the next three months, if you can give us. I can't give you three-month rolling average of CPI, unfortunately, Priya. But tell me why it's not the midterms. You know, I think even on, on, under the current makeup, um, the, the Democrats have not been able to do a whole lot beyond uh, essentially uh, any sort of COVID uh, fiscal stimulus. So we didn't have a lot of fiscal stimulus in the pipeline. They weren't talking about it. So, you know, I think uh, having divided government, the, norm, the, the conventional wisdom is you don't get a whole lot of policy changes. I think people like uh, lack of political uncertainty, which is hard to price. So, you know, I, but, but I would say we had political gridlock even before the midterm. So I don't, you know, I, I don't think there'll be a whole lot. I do worry about the debt ceiling, but you can't position for that today. That's going to be something we're going to have to deal with pretty much all of next year. So I don't think it's a, it's a big event. It's all going to be uh, sort of uh, setting up for 24. CPI is the number one thing the Fed is focused on. So it's going to tell us whether that December meeting is 75 or 50. You know, are we seeing some decline in, uh, in some of the more uh, broad-based nature of this inflation number? So it's not just the headline number. I'd like to see the, the details of that report, because I think that will tell us a lot more about how entrenched inflation expectations are getting. Mike Dada, what's your take on this, sir? Yeah, I agree with that. I think the inflation statistics are going to be more important than the election. You know, typically markets do like gridlock, but as mentioned, um, we've already had a, a you know gridlock for, for all practical purposes, and the Fed is really laser focused on the inflation readings. It's put the business cycle in a bit of a pickle because inflation will tend to lag the cycle. So if you have the Fed chasing down lagging indicators with a very rapid succession of interest rate increases and quantitative tightening, there is a very significant risk that the Fed 
significantly overshoots neutral. And, you know, that does put us in a bind for next year in terms of the business cycle outlook. But I do think we're going to get some good news on CPI inflation. One quick statistic for you, John, the prices paid index uh, from the ISM manufacturing data has collapsed to 46.6 as of October. Back in March, it was above 87. There's this about a six month lead time uh, from that index over the headline CPI. So we should, you know, I'm not going to bet the farm on the next reading this week, but I think over the next three to six months, we should have some better news on the inflation front. Mike, answer this one for me. Do you think inflation can fall as quickly as it rose? Yeah, I think it can fall quite rapidly uh, if the economy is slowing significantly. And I do think there is evidence of that. We've had a lot of volatility in the GDP statistics and a lot of confusion. But if you look at real final sales for the private sector, we've lost a tremendous amount of momentum over the course of the last three quarters. And in fact, you know, Q3 was essentially stall speed. There's actually a slight lead um, from those statistics to payroll growth. And the most recent numbers would suggest a, a fairly significant deceleration in the labor market. And if we think about what the Fed is focused on, headline and core inflation together, but some of the more lagging um, aspects of, of inflation that have a lot of inertia, wages, rents, course, uh, services inflation, that's going to take a, a bit more time. But I do think those numbers are going to be moving down uh, as we get into next year with much weaker growth and probably a recession. Priya, this is a big question. Is inflation stickier on the way back down? So I'm a little more concerned that it is going to be sticky. I mean, you know, declining from 8% headline inflation to 5 maybe that's a little bit faster because some of the commodity price increases go away. I do worry about this, the broad-based nature of, of service inflation. You know, and I, I'm linking that somewhat to wage inflation. Wage inflation is running at a 5% level. It's going to be really hard. And, and, and the labor market, we just had the, uh, the last payroll report last week, still showing strength. And I think it, we're coming into a growth slowdown with an extremely tight labor market, if companies are going to essentially hoard labor and uh, you know not have the layoffs, they may stop hiring, they may reduce job openings. But if the, until the layoffs start, I think wages are going to stay high and that's going to prevent um, CPI, core CPI, from getting close to that 2% target. I think you know there is the decline, which we are also looking for. But I worry about sticky on the way down and sort of if we start to look like we're stabilizing at 4%, 5% inflation, it's much lower than here, but it's much too high for that Fed 2% target. I think they're telling us they're committed to that. They're willing to risk pain. And I think that's the environment where with slowing growth, I would completely agree with Michael. I think we're seeing signs that the consumer is slowing, that savings buffer is coming down. But can the Fed respond? If inflation is sticky, I think they're going to um, stand strong and then we're going to see no fiscal support, which divided government will bring us, and very limited monetary support. I think the hikes will stop, but I don't think they can afford to signal rate cuts with inflation high. So I think it's a key question. Is it going to be sticky? Um, and at what level? I think if we get closer to 3%, they might say, well, that's kind of close to 2 But if we are getting stuck at 4 or 5%, I think it's much too high. And the Fed will just have to say, you know what? We told you there's going to be pain. It's a little more than we thought, but we have to deal with this. This is the cost of getting inflation back down to 2%. So Priya, how does that assessment inform your view on the depth and duration of a potential downturn next year? Sure. So, you know, um, I, I think there's, there's a view out there for sh short, shallow recession. The shallow part I do see because we're coming into a recession with not a whole lot of leverage in the system. I do worry that there's hidden forms of leverage. I think UK LDI tells us that there could be leverage in the derivatives market, which is not well understood. But maybe it is shallow because the consumer is in a better position. The corporate sector has termed out debt. But I think it could be much longer. And we're all going to spend all next year looking for the Fed to respond, and they may not be able to respond. So how this affects our view is, uh, you know, that we, we do think we head into a recession. But unlike the last few recessions, we don't see the Fed responding for a good six months after the recession starts. We do see them starting to ease by the end of next year and really ramping up those eases in 24. But, you know, the, and, and how do you trade that? Well, do you buy the two-year? Typically has been the best trade into a recession 
recession. I would say if inflation is high, the two years is going to be a very frustrating long. It's better to be long tens. We actually went long tens last week. I think we're peaking in, in, in terms of longer term rates. Uh, that might be a safer place to be in until we see clear and convincing signs. These are the Fed words, which is why I want, would like the next three months of CPI rather than just Thursday, um, you know, for the Fed to say, OK, we've, we can now start to slow down as well as um, start to congregate around what that terminal rate is, as opposed to yeah. telling us, which they did last week, that it's highly uncertain where they end up in, in terms of the hiking cycle. This is why there's an argument right now that the outcome of these midterms may not be important tomorrow, next week, a month from now, three months from now, but could take on increased importance 12 months from now because monetary policy won't respond to a downturn. It's actively achieving one, looking to actually achieve one. We won't have that fiscal offset because Congress can't deliver one. And with all of this in mind, Mike Dada, I'm going to go back to the question I just asked Priya Misra. Short and shallow is the consensus. Do you challenge that consensus view? Well, I think that's what we're all hoping for. Um, nobody wants to see a long, deep, disruptive recession, especially, especially because you know, we'll end up with a populist uprising. And that's, you know, that's really not good. Uh, and it's not good for the Fed and, and their independence either. Uh, but we are in this predicament because the Fed ended up with a false sense of security over the inflation outlook by focusing on deeply lagging indicators. And monetary policy was way too accommodative. And so unfortunately now the Fed wants to make sure that inflation expectations stay low. And so the policy is to continue raising, to get to restrictive and to hold. And restrictive and hold means that, you know, obviously there's a risk of a recession and it might be deeper and longer uh, than, than we're all hoping for. Uh, and so really all it would take to, to create a, a deeper downturn than anticipated is just for the Fed to impose a restrictive monetary stance and, and hold it there. Um, so, you know, how that plays out is really going to depend on the behavior of some of these lagging indicators that the Fed is very focused on. Hopefully, uh, what can come out of this uh, once we get through it is a more forward-looking, preemptive monetary policy. When the Fed falls way behind the curve and the economy gets ahead of steam and inflation expose, explodes, you know, it, those are tend to be short, very volatile business cycles. And that's, you know, essentially what we're dealing with now. Uh, so I think there are you know, ways to, to run policy in a, in a much more effective, forward-looking fashion that will be more stabilizing for the business cycle. Mike Dada, Priya Misra, sticking with us. Equity futures right now, positive four-tenths of 1%. Coming up, the Fed doubling down on its inflation fight. Inflation should come down, but don't expect its drop to be immediate or predictable. We've been through multiple shocks, as I discussed, and significant shocks simply take time to dampen. Plus more pushback from Capitol Hill. That conversation, up next. in my view, to, to, to think about or be talking about pausing our rate hike. We still have some ways to go. And incoming data since our last meeting suggests that the ultimate level of interest rates will be higher than previously expected. The economy taking center stage as voters cast their ballot. Democrats ramping up the pressure on the Fed. Congresswoman Maxine Waters writing the following. Enough is enough. The Fed has acknowledged that it can take time for a rate hike to fully take hold on the economy. I implore the Fed to heed these warnings before moving forward with additional rate hikes. Just the latest addition to a growing list of warnings coming out of Capitol Hill. The big question, are there more to come? Priya Misra, Mike Dada back with us for a final thought. Priya, for both of you, and Priya, I'll start with you. How complicated is life about to get down in Washington for this Federal Reserve? I think it's already not easy and it's going to get worse. Uh, you know, I think that's because as the data slows down, it's going to be even harder for the Fed to make the case that they're uh, overemphasizing one part of the mandate versus another. You know, right now, inflation's too high. So they're emphasizing on, on inflation and the labor market looks strong. But they're going to get a lot of political heat. I think they're going to have to keep saying that they're independent. They are slowing down the pace of hikes, so that allows them to recalibrate policy if needed. But I think it's 
still going to come down to inflation. They're going to have to ignore a lot of, I think there'll be more um, negativity. There's, they're also in a negative net income position. So it's not just about rate hikes. It's the fact that the balance sheet is taking losses. It's going to look politically pretty ugly for the Fed, but I think they hold strong and, uh, and they base it on, on what happens to inflation as well as uh, the labor market. Mike Dada, your thoughts, sir? Yeah, I completely agree with all of that. A lot of good points there. So, you know, if you look at these polls as we head into the election today, people are upset and agitated about inflation. Uh, but as mentioned, the labor market is very, very tight. You know, perhaps the unemployment rate is just bottoming out now. Typically, the unemployment rate will bottom, hit a cyclical trough about nine months before a recession. So we don't really have the you know, um, the disturbance or the, you know, folks being upset because the labor market's loosening. They're upset about inflation. As we get into next year and the unemployment rate moves up and there's a likely recession, then that could start to, to deliver more political heat uh, onto the Fed's lap and they'll have to deal with that. Um, but, you know, this is a predicament of their own making. Um, you know, they overly eased monetary and fiscal policy and they held there too long. So they're trying to reverse it. And there's no easy way to do that without a disruption in the business cycle. And so that's what we're all having to deal with, unfortunately. You've basically both just said it, that this could be easier relative to what it could have been if they'd gone earlier. And I would say that this is easy relative to what it will be in 12 months time with the dual mandates in conflict. And as Mike, you suggest, that's a story still in our future. And things could get dicey down in Washington as the Federal Reserve looks to do even more in the face of higher unemployment. In fact, that seems to be the stated goal. Mike Dada, Priya, Priya Misra, to the both of you, fantastic as always. Your equity market looks a little something like this on the S&P. It's positive by a third of 1%. We've had two days of gains, Friday, Monday. Can we make it Tuesday as well? Coming up the morning calls and later, strategists on the street bracing for impact from midterms. We'll catch up with JP Morgan's Clinton Warren looking for gridlock. More on that around the opening bell. This is Bloomberg. Five minutes away from the opening bell, equity shaping up as follows on the S&P 500, pushing higher on the Nasdaq also by about a third of 1%, six tenths of 1% respectively. Let's get you some morning calls. First up, Evercore downgrading Lyft to inline, expecting another challenging year with results raising concerns about the company's outlook. Jeffries downgrading Six Flags Entertainment to hold, seeing limited upside and mounting risk to growth. And finally, Wedbush downgrading William Sonoma to neutral, highlighting a weakening macro environment. That stock is down by about 1.6%. Coming up, JP Morgan's Clinton Warren, expecting a divided government right here in Washington. Why political gridlock could be the best outcome for the equity market bull. So that conversation, up next. Seconds away from the cash open in New York. Let's get you some price action going into that opening bout this Tuesday morning. Good morning to you all just tuning in. Equities are positive by a third of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, up six tenths of 1%. Gains on Friday, gains on Monday. Can we make it gains on Tuesday? There's your opening bow. Switch up the board and get to the bond market. What a year it's been in the bond market for fixed income. Treasuries lower, yields higher. Today, the other way around. Treasury's up yields down by two basis points, just short of 420 now, 418.85. Euro clinging on to parity, euro dollar negative, let's call it a tenth of 1%. And at the epicenter of this election debate is inflation and what happens here. Crude back in the 90s over the last couple of weeks, 91.55 on WTI, we're down a quarter of 1%. That's the price action. Let's get you some movers, and we can do that with Katie Greifeld. Hey, Katie. Hey, John. Well, I have some good news. If you're a stock bull, this is the best possible November setup for you. The average gain for the S&P 500 in a midterm election year is 2%. If you compare that to a presidential year, that gain whittles down to just 1.1%. And in years where nothing is happening, November delivers just a point. 6% gain. So again, from the perspective of an equity bull, that is purely the perspective I'm talking from, the best possible outcome today is that Republicans take control of just
just one chamber. If you look back since the end of the Second World War, years with a split Congress have produced the best returns, almost 13% for the S&P 500. If you look at that chart there, years with one party in control, either party, they've trailed the average overall about 8.2% there. And it may not matter too much if recent trends do hold. John, I don't need to tell you that tech has been struggling lately, so much so that the tech ETF's five-year returns are just about even with XLE. That is the big energy ETF on the street. Given how huge the tech sector is, of course, that's bad news on a benchmark level, John. That chart is amazing to look at. And, Kaylee, I haven't looked at that yet. That mm -hmm. is absolutely unbelievable how much we've taken back from that big tech rally. Kaylee, great work as always. About a minute or so, two minutes into this session, Tuesday morning, equities up by about a tenth of 1% on the S&P, on the Nasdaq up two tenths of 1%, two events this week, CPI on Thursday. Before we get there, it's all about the midterms, red versus blue, Wall Street, Weighing the market impact of the midterm elections, Morgan Stanley's Mike Wilson on this program, expecting a divided government to keep this bear market rally going. The midterms, though, however, could have lasting implications if it's a decisive victory for the Republicans. The majority of the inflation spike was a, a result of excessive fiscal spending, and that, of course, will be curtailed even if the Republicans just win one chamber. Ultimately, it should be good for bonds, bond yields lower, has been key to our tactical rally call. Bullish for bonds and bullish for stocks. That's the takeaway from Mike Wilson. Laurie Cavacina of RBC echoing that call, writing the following. Equity investors would take a bullish cue from the historical playbook, which indicates that stocks tend to experience above trend gains of 13 to 14 percent on an average basis in years that have a Democratic president and a split or Republican Congress. Joining us now to discuss is J.P. Morgan's Clinton Warren. Clinton, let's start here with the so-called midterm seasonality. Is it relevant given the unique moment that we're in right now? Yes, I think it's, it's very relevant. And I just hope everyone takes the time out of their busy schedules to uh, go out and vote. It's one of the great privileges that we have here in, in, in the States. And since 1943, there's been 19 midterm elections with the incumbent party picking up two, uh, uh, picking up seats in the House two times and seats in the Senate four times. So based on what everyone is thinking about this, this election cycle with, with citizens focused on the economy, inflation, there's no surprise that a lot of the pollsters have the Republicans picking up at least uh, the, the House and, and even maybe the Senate, which seems to be more of a toss up. So we are heading into what seems to be a divided government, which, as your chart showed before, seems to be quite positive for the equity markets. Uh, what we have seen historically is that volatility decreases as we get some certainty on the political landscape and markets do rebound uh, nicely. However, I do think the impact of political uh, circumstances this year will be somewhat muted as we have CPI right coming two days later on Thursday, uh, which, which, which will probably take, uh, take all the headlines and take uh, all the market participants' uh, uh, thoughts. One thing I will say, though, is that if we do have that deep recession that some pundits are thinking about, a divided government does make it harder for fiscal policy to be passed. Obviously, monetary policy will be uh, something on the Fed's mind. But if there's that deep recession and we need some sort of fiscal stimulus, it may be hard for a divided government to accomplish something to help us get out of that mess. Uh, so, Clinton, it raises an important question then. If fiscal policy is constrained because of grid lockdown here in Washington, is that a positive on net? If you're saying short term it might be, long term maybe not, is it a positive or not? I think you have to play out the timeline, right? So a lot of forecasters are showing some sort of recession into the mid to latter parts of 2023. So if that happens, the Fed's going to be going on a, a rate lowering campaign and that gets you into 2024, which is uh, another election year and, and one that will probably be more heated. So I think there'll be uh, things on both sides and, and motivations on both sides, but it could uh, lead to, to a harder landing if there is that deep recession that some economists are forecasting. Clinton, every time we do this, when it comes to the midterms, when it comes to any election, the presidential election, the general, we always talk about gridlock. Clinton, it feels like gridlock is the consensus view, and it makes me wonder whether it's already priced. Clinton, is it already priced? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, everyone that I talk to has uh, a divided government kind of priced into the models. I think the biggest question on everyone's mind is what's going to happen in the Senate. And the last uh, polls I looked at is like a 50-50 toss-up. But either way, that leads to, to a divided government. Uh, so, yeah, it's going to be gridlock, which slows things down, which makes Washington kind of pause. Uh, but I'm just concerned that if there's something that major needs to happen, that both sides will come together 
and do what's right for the country. So, Clinton, let's talk about the tail risk. We've dealt with a consensus view. Let's talk about the tails. What happens if the Democrats hold on? What is it about that scenario that unnerves investors and clients you speak to? Yeah, I think a lot of people are concerned about uh, some increased spending that, that can happen, especially on uh, where we are in the economy on the brink of, of all the additional spending that we just had coming out of the pandemic. So I think that's one of the, the biggest worries. Um, and I think people just want to get back to more, a more normal environment. And we're starting to feel some of the effects of, of the pandemic handling over now. That's why you see equity markets down 25 percent. You see bond markets down 16 percent. So I do think that tail risk of uh, the Democrats taking and retaining uh, uh, both uh, House uh, and the Senate, uh, the, the biggest uh, concern would be increased spending, which has some people uh, on pause based on where we are in the second economic cycle. Now, Clinton, we all understand why this is consequential for sentiment. Can you help me understand from a sector basis how this could be important too? And let's pick out one, let's pick out energy. Energy has done tremendously well, brilliantly, under Democratic leadership. And Clinton, I just wonder whether sometimes we get this all back to front. How relevant is it? No, it's, re it's very relevant. And if you look at just earnings so far, uh, Q3 earnings, uh, 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 the, the, the earnings have come in up 3%. If you strip out energy, they're actually down 5% or so. So uh, energy has, has done well for a number of reasons. I don't think you can just put that into what's going on in Washington. There's another of a number of other factors that have played into that. Uh, so it's something to watch. I just don't know if it's going to be a, a major uh, impact to, to that sector in the short run. Obviously, there's long longer-term impacts uh, with, with some things on their agenda, but I don't see it being anything to worry about in the short term. Well, Clinton, let's finish on this bear market rally. You heard from Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley. He thinks it can continue off the back of the midterms. The events and how the dominoes fall are pretty clear. You get a gridlock, it means bond yields fall, bond yields fall, equities rally. Is that something you're on side with? Once again, I mean, I do think the midterm is, is something that everyone's going to be watching, but we have inflation data coming out, CPI, on Thursday. And I was trying to think of some sort of analogy. And to me, inflation is like roaches. The Fed just can't get rid of it. They're throwing everything at this problem, and they just can't get rid of it. And that's going to be the thing that's going to take the headlines. It's going to take market participants. And that's the only thing that folks are going to be thinking about uh, uh, come Thursday morning. So, yeah, there's going to be some short-term noise. The market's going to move. Uh, uh, Tuesday, uh, late Wednesday, as things are starting to get results, but on Thursday, it's going to be old news as everyone's going to be focused on what the Fed's going to do and what's happening with inflation. Hey, Clinton, awesome to catch up. Clinton Warren there of JP Morgan Private Bank. Right now, the equity market essentially unchanged on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq, we're positive to 0.03% going into a major event. And then from there, from here, it's on to CPI on Thursday, looking for year-over-year -year inflation to come in just inside of 8%. Of course, Wall Street very focused on that core month-over-month -month figure. Coming up on this program, U.S. voters heading to the polls with all eyes on Pennsylvania's Senate race. Social Security and Medicare is in the ballot. There's something else on the ballot. Character. John has character, integrity, and he's going to be a hell of a good senator. That conversation still ahead. This is Bloomberg Z Open. I'm Lisa Mateo, live in the principal room. Coming up, Lyft co founder and president John Zimmer. That's at 5 p.m. in New York, 10 p.m. London. This is Bloomberg. to get out, you have to vote. Democracy is literally on the ballot. The stakes are high. Our country has never been so bad as it is right now. Under my predecessor, the economy was in ruin. Let me tell you something, Pennsylvania. John has character, integrity, and he's going to be a hell of a good senator. The people of Pennsylvania are going to elect Dr. Mehmet Oz to the United States Senate. This is a defining moment for the nation. The biggest names descending on Pennsylvania as the race between Federman and Oz takes center stage. 
everyone that's willing to go out and go knock on doors and to get out the votes right now because there is just so much at stake right now in this race right now. I don't have to come up with any brilliant new ideas. You actually have them all. That We have the answers, the solutions. But John Fetterman's not one of them. I won my very first election by one single vote. Got knocked down, I have that stroke, but yeah, we're I, back I need, up and we're taking TV. it all across. Bloomberg County Lines joins us now from Philadelphia. Morning, Katie. Morning, John. This is an incredibly, incredibly close race and one that is crucial because it ultimately could help decide the balance of the Senate. The seat in question is that of retiring Republican Senator Pat Toomey. So this is one of the Democrats' best opportunities to flip a seat. Of course, the man trying to do that is John Fetterman, the Democratic candidate up against Mehmet Oz. Fetterman had been holding a lead throughout this entire campaign, but the latest polls this morning, the 538 aggregate aggregate polling, shows that Oz is ahead by half of 1%. So this is going to be a nail biter race. And because this is Pennsylvania, because the rules here dictate that you cannot start counting mail in ballots until 7 a.m. on election day. So, really, just a few hours uh, ago, it means we may not have results for this race for several days. Already 1.1 million mail in ballots have been returned. So, that is a lot to count. And then, if the margin of the ultimate tally is less than half of 1%. This vote would go to an automatic recount. And if you trust the polls, it does indeed look like the race could be that close. And of course, if Fetterman is able to pull it off, if this does flip to a Democratic seat, that means the Republicans would have to win at least two out of three in Nevada, Arizona, or Georgia. So that is why all eyes are here in Pennsylvania today. Turnout is high. Voters are mobilized. And we are going to be looking for results for possibly the next several days, Sean. Kelly Lines, thank you. AMH right here in Washington, D.C. I want to continue this conversation. Amory, let's build on this Pennsylvania conversation. Given who was campaigning in that state, is this kind of like a proxy yeah. war, an appetizer <laughs> for the general in two years? That's what it feels like, right? You have the rock stars, the Democrats, the rock stars, the Republicans all coming. Because, as Kaylee says, this is a chance for Democrats to flip that seat. And the reason why they need to flip it is not to gain an edge in a very thin majority they already have in the Senate, it's because they're likely going to lose in some other places. You look like Nevada. They may lose that Democratic hold in Nevada. So this is incredibly important. But also, Jonathan, 2020 presidential election, it came down to Pennsylvania. And it can potentially come down to Pennsylvania for this midterm. There's a whole host of races we could talk about. That's one. Let's talk about another. The governor race in New York. Oh, yeah. It's remarkable to see the president of the United States, campaigning in a state that he won by, I think, 23 points back in 2020, the weekend before the midterms. Democrats if you told me 10 months, ago, 10 months ago that this is what was going to happen, I don't think many people would believe me. I, I'm, I'm shocked. I grew up in New York. We haven't seen a Republican governor since George Pataki. This is something that most Democrats in New York are shocked about, and the fact that is so last minute like descending on, almost chaos it feels like in terms of them trying to get these votes out in a place like New York. The President of the United States is in Westchester County, in Bronxville. You've been there. That says a lot and how worried they are about Tuesday's election. What was the front page of the New York Post today? That they want their streets back and they're gonna and they're endorsing a Zeldin. It feels panicky. Let's talk about something else here in the market. In the market right now, and we're lower by not even a tenth of one percent. I've got a long, long list of guests who have all said gridlock positive for markets. Can you paint a picture for everybody about what gridlock's going to look like for the next two years in Washington, D.C.? I guess they like gridlock because it means there won't be any big legislation in terms of changes, like taxes, et cetera. But when you have gridlock, the most worrisome issue on the docket for this new Congress is going to be the debt ceiling and the fiscal cliff. And when you have gridlock, that's going to be incredibly challenging for them to get through, which is why you have Senator Bernie Sanders saying we should handle it now in the lame duck session before the new year. So gridlock may sound nice in terms of big picture items for the market, but it's still going to be incredibly troublesome to get some of really big picture items like the debt ceiling, like making sure the United States can pay their bills getting those votes. You'll be busy. So will Mike McKee. Mike McKee joins us now out of New York City. Mike McKee, are we going to do this all over again? Looks like we're going to do it all over again. Now, the important thing to realize is the debt ceiling doesn't limit debt. 
The government can spend whatever it wants. It limits the government's ability to pay for that debt. And the problem is not just gridlock, but the Republicans are coming to power saying they are going to hold the country hostage and perhaps default in order to force Joe Biden into some spending cuts. You can see how close we are there to the debt ceiling. Might hit it in the next month or so. We're only about $200 billion below that. And, of course, we've been through this many times before. The government, the Treasury Department, can use what they call extraordinary measures, uh, ways of postponing bill paying, essentially, to stay below it for a while. Bloomberg Economics thinks they can get to late 2023. But that month of drama will weigh on the markets. And the Treasury's, Treasury will be issuing fewer bills because they're going to try to stay below that limit. That will cause problems for money markets. Interest rates will rise. So what happens? Well, what Wall Street thinks will happen is that Republicans will cave before the default because nobody wants a default, and they'll possibly make a spending deal with Biden. And the Fed's reverse repo facility will provide T-bills to the market, so we won't have problems there. But what could happen? The U.S. could default on its debts. We came very close a couple of times in the last decade. Treasury and bond markets would seize up. The U.S. debt would be downgraded, interest rates permanently higher. Oh, and there's one other thing. Uh, the government has a temporary spending bill in place until December 16th, so the possibility of a government shutdown looms if the Republicans want to move this to uh, the confrontation status as well. Uh, the problem, John, is that uh, nobody knows how serious the Republicans are about holding the country hostage, but it is something Wall Street's going to have to pay attention to for the next year. Can I just say that I'm so happy that I don't have to follow this and you guys do it for me, because this is going to get ridiculous quickly. AMH, right here in D.C., Mike McKee over in New York. You've heard it a million times, haven't you? Gridlock is good for this equity market. Gridlock might be the optimal policy stance for this market right now. The question we've got to ask in markets is whether that's the policy stance we need, we want, if we're in a recession 12 months from now. And that's an ongoing debate, and we'll keep having that conversation on this program. On the S&P, we're positive by almost a tenth of 1%. Really no price action to speak of at the index level. On the Nasdaq, we're down by just 0.02%. Let's get you some sector price action. We can do that with Katie Greifeld. Hey, Katie. Hey, John. I'm going to try to make this interesting. Like you said, the S&P 500 just about flat. If you look on the sector level, you have seven higher, four lower, not too much action on either side. We're talking less than 1% moves. You do have materials leading to the upside, energy to the downside, and it's energy and big tech that I want to talk about as we wrap it into this midterms conversation. Obviously, both groups have a lot riding on this election. The progressive ring of the Democratic Party, of course, has expressed the possibility of breaking up big tech. Think Microsoft, Amazon, Apple. On the other side, meanwhile, the White House potential windfall tax on big oil means that the stakes are high for the energy sector as well. But as you can see, uh, both not doing too much. Those outcomes become less likely with a split Congress or even Republican control. Uh, John, I did want to talk about Take-Two Interactive briefly because we are still in earnings season. You had the video game developer report last night and it wasn't too pretty. You had weakness in the mobile business that led to a cut in booking guidance. As you can see, shares are down double digits. That's bringing down the overall video game group just slightly today, John. Katie, thank you. Wonderful, as always. About 22 minutes into the session, we're up a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500. Coming up on Election Day in America, the closing arguments, and, of course, your trading diary through the week ahead. From D.C., this is Bloomberg. Just hours away from the most important midterm election in American history. Remember, the power's in your hands. We're going to take back the House. We're going to take back the Senate. You wait. Uh, Democrats get blown out on Tuesday. There's people running for office that want to take away our rights. Democracy is on the ballot. 
It is. They spent trillions of dollars and printed trillions when they were warned, if you do this, you are going to drive inflation through the roof. One of two, the two major political parties in our country openly flirting with political violence, and we have seen the results that that brings. We're possibly one day away from losing this country. Well, there's a lot on the line in this election. It's a country-saving election. We just have to remember who in the hell we are. We are the United States of America. A final word from the President of the United States. The closing arguments are in. The results are as away. The price action going into it all looks like this. A third day of gains on the S&P 500. Muted price action this morning, as you might expect, 25 minutes into the session, up by a quarter of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, up six-tenths of 1%. The state of play in the bond market looks like this. Twos, tens and thirties. Two-year yields come in four basis points. 468 on a 10-year, down five basis points to 415.91. Your trading diary. Midterm elections underway. Congress up for grags. You know that already. More Fed speak through the week. Wednesday with Williams, Bark and Kashkari all on deck. It continues with Waller, Harker, Logan, Daly, Mester and George all speaking on Thursday. Plus, we get another round of jobless claims. And the main event, according to so many of you, it's not right here in Washington. It's not the vote. It's CPI on Thursday from Washington, D.C. Thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg.